Welcome back. Um, it's, it's a pity this is the last day of the course because there's still some restaurants I haven't visited yet, but I've now managed three different restaurants in this area. So I'll be writing a guidebook soon for, for visiting academics. Uh, what you need to know, where, where to go. Actually, I've been to four. The other one was a bit further away, wasn't it? Um, good. Right, well, um, this is actually an example of social capital in a sort of way, I think. It was on a wall around the corner, five minutes from my office, and somebody had just decided they would put this artwork there. Um, it's made of plastic. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, they've lost a leg. Um, and also, the thin, thin, attaching this sort of balloon or heart. And so for me, this was, this to some extent summarizes the challenge of high cost medicines. We want to hold on to our money, not because we just love money and want to count it and live with it. That money we use for other things. So we are worried about the cost of health care. But we also want to hold on to, well, the heart can be anything. It can be our, our health. Or it could almost be our humanity. And our humanity says we should be caring for other people. And so what happens if you've got a, so people with a, a serious condition, that you've got a drug that could help treat that condition, but the drug's expensive? How do you, um, you get pulled in different directions? You're worried about the cost, but you, you want to capture, you want to hold on to the health and everything else. So that's, some, that's where this character comes from. <laughs> um, as you can see, I spend all my spare time walking the streets looking for photo opportunities for, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for lectures. No, I, I just, I, one part of my waking, <laughs> you know, my attention is looking for these things. <clears throat> One I found in Japan, which I think is a rather interesting one on information and public health, is outside of police stations where they record accidents. In, I think it's in the last 24 hours. And also, I don't know if the red is a fatality or just a serious injury, but you've got the number of accidents and the number of injuries, uh, which I find it's interesting. It's a sort of quite a low-cost public health intervention. We were just discussing about are all interventions expensive? And maybe that's fairly cheap. Of course, how do we, how do we well, you, what you could do is set up a trial. So in some areas, you don't show the information. In other areas, you do show it. And then try and uh, establish if there's a link to accidents. But anyway, that's another topic. Right, so facing the challenge of high cost medicines. <clears throat> and remember the link from this morning. If you're not going to leave it to the marketplace, you've got to have some sort of mechanism for making these decisions about which medicines will be adopted, which won't be. Um, now, of course, you could have processes or procedures which don't involve any economics. And historically, a lot of decisions in healthcare haven't involved um, economics. Historically, they haven't even involved evidence. Um, whichever man in the room has got the greyest hair or shouts loudest I'm being a little bit cynical here but um, you know committees seniority and deference to seniority it's taken years for evidence based medicine to try and replace that I think and in more recent years as well as evidence based medicine I think we must look at both clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, new med this won't come as news to you. New medicines are generally costly. And over time, that cost is increasing. Naturally, patients and clinicians want access to these new medicines. Clinicians want to do the best for their patients. 
I assume. The patients will, will almost try anything, if, if the condition's serious, will almost try anything to, to get some relief of it. The pharmaceutical industry and those governments involved in decision making over new drugs are quite keen to get more rapid decisions. For the industry it's very clear that if you think you've got a, a good product and you're time limited in t terms of patent protection, you want to get it out there, you want to get it used. After all, your, your job is to make money for your stockholders. Government, well, they want rapid decision making for many reasons. One, they don't want the media complaining. They don't want patient groups on television criticising um, the government. But more than that, the government also want to improve people's health. And you don't necessarily improve health by denying treatment. If you've got a, a good treatment that represents reasonable value for money as well, you want to get it out there quickly because there's people out there who could benefit. Why delay? And so we're seeing a push in recent years towards more rapid decision making. And the regulators have joined in. So FDA and EMA, I can't speak for Japan here, but it might be the same. The regulators in Europe and America are trying to speed up decision making. So they've introduced all sorts of new schemes where they, they give a sort of fast track approval to, to some particular drugs. New drugs, sometimes it seems as if, there's, we have an expression in, in English, um, if you're waiting for a bus, it's always the case that you wait a long time, then three come along at the same time. And of course, you can only get on one of them. It's almost like that with drugs. You might, in some therapeutic areas, be waiting many years for a new drug, and then suddenly, in quick succession, you've got a series of drugs, treatments that have come along. Now this causes some real challenges for evaluation, which I'll be trying to highlight. And so, this idea of drugs coming along in clusters, this idea of the regulators wanting to make deci approval decisions earlier, more rapid decision making, this is actually leading us sometimes to have poorer evidence of clinical effectiveness, not better evidence. So we might be more, more ready to use um, evidence in our decision making, but paradoxically in some of these clinical areas, we're getting poorer evidence because we're having to make a decision at an earlier and earlier stage about the merits of particular technologies. This, I like this table, it's um, from JAMA Oncology in 2015. What they looked at was 20 oncologic drugs that were approved by the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, in the US between 2009 and 2013. You may know some of these names. Uh, at one time or another, I've probably been trying to evaluate them all. Um, this is the cost per year of treatment, these numbers. They are in US dollars, uh, but by any standard, these are quite big numbers. Now these are not, let me say, drugs for a necessarily a very rare condition for just a very small patient group. All right, the patient group may not be huge, but it's sizable numbers of patients. And uh, these are really quite high costs. More than that, um, it appears while the costs are going up, the benefit we're getting 
relative to that cost is declining. So this is a study um, actually in an economic journal for, for a change and again looking at cancer drugs again launched in the, in the US they identified 58 drugs launched in the US between 1995 and 2013 and they worked out what the relationship between additional cost was of these drugs and the additional benefit um, just measured in terms of additional years of life now that of course is a, a narrow measure of benefit but it's a, a measure of benefit so they're looking at how much the healthcare insurers were having to pay to get additional years of life using these cancer therapies and what they found was in 1995 it was about $54,000. By 2005, this had risen to $139,000, paying to get an additional year of life. And by 2013, it had gone to over $200,000. And so this is very clear evidence, at least in the area of cancer therapies, we're getting less and less for our money. With that newer therapies, they may be improving health, but the amount we're having to pay for each unit of improvement, measuring it here as years of life, the amount we're having to pay is going up and up. Um, in this paper, it's quite interesting. They argue there's quite strong incentives um, to set high prices. Uh, and it's partly to do with something in economics called elasticity of demand. I won't go into elasticity of demand, but basically, in the US, there's little, relatively little resistance to high prices for new drugs. Uh, there's a number of reasons for this, but I, I won't go into that. By contrast, in Europe, there is quite a lot of resistance to um, paying the high prices, and so, these authors actually suggest the high prices in the United States are to some extent due to the less high, but still high, prices in Europe. So the manufacturer is essentially charging what they can in the different markets. And so the data I've just shown you in these two tables is very much US prices. Prices in Japan will typically be less and prices in Europe will typically be less. But the phenomenon of high cost drugs and getting less benefit for our money, that's global. A number of justifications have been suggested for high drug prices. And the main one that the industry emphasise is the high cost of research and development. And just as we were walking up the road from lunch, we are talking about, you know, is it, a, is it a billion dollars per new drug? Is it three billion? You know, what, what is the number? So the manufacturers would argue it's getting increasingly expensive to, to develop these drugs. That's why we have to charge high prices. Um, they would also argue that there's, there are benefits to patients still, and maybe these benefits are particularly valuable in patients where we can't do much for them just now, so it's just to be able to do something has a particular sort of extra value. The other argument that's put forward by the industry is that um, market forces, we were talking about that earlier today, demand and supply, will we'll settle prices to reasonable levels. So the idea here is a new drug will arrive, there'll be a high price, but quite quickly other drugs come along and the price comes down. And there is some evidence of this, but it's not nearly as marked as, as you might ima imagine. And the final argument they use is if you control price, you stifle innovation. Now, that does sound really threatening because if we control prices, we're going to get less innovation, we get fewer new drugs, 
it's almost as if medicine stops advancing. All of these justifications are heavily contested, <laughs> um, particularly the first one about the, the cost of developing new drugs. Um, yes? Um, so yes, yes, yes. I think they call it broader marketing. Advertising sounds just a little bit, uh, <laughs> I don't know. But yes, yes, they do. They do spend a great deal. And so that makes it sound a bit hollow, the claim that we must charge high prices because of the research development cost. You could then say, well, don't spend so much on the marketing. Um, if these drugs are so valuable, Maybe it's not difficult to tell people about them at low cost. Yeah, I think that's true. There's also an argument. Does the causation, do high prices follow from high research and development costs, or is it the other way around? You have the high prices first of all, and that makes it attractive for companies then, if they can get high prices, to invest more in R&D. So it's not at all clear, um, that argument. There are a few reasons why, specifically in the US, um, prices might be high. Um, for example, Medicare, that's the program that, federal program that provides health care to the elderly. Um, Medicare are obliged, in most areas of health care, are obliged to purchase the drugs. There's a set discount, but not a very high one, and uh, they can't negotiate the price. The price is the price for them. Now, in that sort of situation, it's quite a strong incentive for the manufacturer to set high prices. Um, it's also the case in, in, in some, many states in the, in the US, um, the insurance coverage must include these cancer treatments. And so if there's some other payer, that means you're gonna get a bit less resistance from the consumer and the patient because the insurer is going to be picking up the cost. And the other argument is that um, the Affordable Care Act was successful. I don't know if I can say this. I, I hope Donald Trump won't catch this lecture <laughs> in, in a few months' time and he'll start tweeting about, about, about me. But the um, Affordable Care Act seems to be quite successful in bringing many million more um, patients uh, into, the, into the protected area of insured coverage. Um, and of course that adds to demand. And with adding added demand, that drives higher prices. Interestingly in this article, um, Ramsey in Health Affairs, he suggests that a really important um, reason f for um, higher prices is that the cost of genome sequencing has gone down. I think, I think, well, if the cost of genome sequencing has gone down, doesn't that reduce the costs of development? And his argument is that um, it's making it, um, likely that your opportunity to market your drug is getting shorter and shorter. Because the, these, this particular important element of research cost has gone down, that's encouraging a lot more activity. And so drugs are then coming along faster. So any new drug you've got, you've got the market to yourself for a shorter period of time. And so what are you going to do? Well, let's charge a, as high a price as we can because quite soon I won't be able to sell this drug. It's quite an interesting argument, quite, quite subtle one. Okay, the two case studies I want to talk about. The first one I've entitled a pharmacological success story and a decision-making challenge. I could have maybe said a decision-making nightmare. Um, HCV, hepatitis C virus, was first identified in 1989, quite recently. Um, everybody sort of knew it existed before and they just used to talk about non-A 
non-B. But uh, they actually identified it formally in 1989. And quite quickly after that, treatments started coming along. Interferon was approved in 1991, then ribavirin and interferon 98, and pegylated interferon 2001. And then it went quiet for a while. And I should point out that these treatments, ribavirin and pegylated interferon, work, but they're not great. Maybe 50% clearance rate of the virus, and with quite a lot of adverse effects and quite a, quite a tough treatment regimen. So then, Tilaprevir and Boseprevir came along, approved in 2011, fairly closely followed by Sufosprevir and Simeprevir. And uh, it was particularly the former, Sufosprevir, that really changed things. And then we've had more and more approvals. Um, I won't read them all out. And we've got more in the pipeline. And there's been various ones where um, they were developing one and they say, oh, no, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> These existing treatments are so effective now, the new ones, that by the time my drug's ready, there'll be no one to sell it to. And so there's been quite a few have dropped out of the pipeline. So hep C, slowly progressive disease of the liver. About 80% of it's mild disease, but in the more extreme end of the spectrum, you've got very, very serious health problems, liver failure, um, and primary liver cancer. Lots of genotypes. And of course, this drug came along. Just take a tablet a day. Virtually no side effects for anybody. Maybe clears up in 12 weeks, maybe 24 weeks. And just give me $1,000 for each tablet. Now, I think if they'd called it $999, they may have just got away with it. But 1000 was just, it's just too sort of, it rolls off the tongue too well. You know, 1000 pounds a tablet. Um, UK price actually four hundred pounds, but it uh, doesn't sound doesn't sound quite so exciting. Four hundred pounds. I'm not sure the Japanese price. Probably quite high, but not nearly as high as the US price. So what I want to talk about is how did the UK make a decision to say yes or no to sofosbuvir and indeed all the other other veers as well. Well, what we do is we start by thinking, what are the current treatments? So at the time when sofosbuvir was introduced, um, these were the treatments, partly depended on which genotype you were, also issues of whether you had HIV co-infection. But probably the most common treatment was pegylated interferon plus ribavirin. But just recently, tilaprevir and boseprevir had been approved. And so the combination of telaprevir and pegylated interferon, ribavirin, was, was an example being used. So that was the setting. And so you then got the new drug coming along. And what you want to do is compare what will change if we introduce the new drug instead of the existing treatments. So if you like the decision problem, uh, a very standard way, as you've probably come across it, the PICO format, P population, I intervention, C comparator, O outcomes. Um, population, adults with chronic hepatitis C. The, int the intervention, well initially, when sofosbuvir was being considered, it was in combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, or in combination with ribavirin. Comparators, well as I say, probably the main comparator, pegylated interferon and ribavirin, and then there's a possibility of telaprevir or boseprevir. Okay. So what do you... Doesn't want to advance. No. So what do we do? We, we're trying to calculate cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness. And this is a measure, if you like, of value for money. What are we getting in health terms improved health for the money spent. And 
the heart of this is to calculate something called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or abbreviated to the ICER, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And so in this case, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio is the cost of the new treatment, so SPR would be sophosphavir, pegylated interferon and ribavirin, less the cost of existing treatment, pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And in the bottom line is the difference, the, the health gain or change in health. The qualities that we expect with sophosphavir, pegylated interferon and ribavirin, minus the qualities we would have got expected if we just used pegylated interferon and ribavirin. So in the top line we've got the change in cost, which we anticipate will be an increase. And the bottom line, we've got the change in qualities or our measure of health, health improvement. So how do we calculate qualities? Well, qualities are estimated by weighting the time patients will spend in different health states. So in this condition, for example, patients move through different health states as the disease progresses. They spend a certain amount of time in each health state. And we weight the time they spend in these health states. We're weighting it by a measure of their health status. The idea being that it's better to be in a mild health state than a more severe health state. And we want the weight to reflect that. To calculate the costs, well, the cost is a combination of the cost of treatment so that's the sulfosphavir, pegylated interferon, ribavirin, but also the costs associated with being in any particular health state. So these patients, they don't just get treated, but over time they're going to be in different health states and they're going to get all sorts of other treatments as well. We want to capture that as well. So what we need is a model to predict what will happen to patients with current treatment and compare it with what will happen with the new treatment. And this was a model that was used and has been used, a similar one, in most of the other studies. So, let me explain this. Um, this is going to be, well, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a cohort model or a, a Markov model. We're imagining a cohort of individuals. For example, suppose you've got a thousand individuals who start in this state here. They're not cirrhotic, so the disease is at an early stage, but they are HCV positive. Okay? Now, if you're able to clear the virus, you move them into this health state, SVR, um, sustained viral response. Essentially, the virus is undetectable um, uh, 12 weeks after treatment. Another possibility is the patient is going to advance over time and may then get into a state called compensated cirrhosis. So basically they are um, cirrhotic but the liver is still functioning, not so well, but still functioning. If things go further, they can move to decompensated cirrhosis where if they're going to survive, they're going to need a liver transplant. Also, once you reach compensated cirrhosis, you're at a substantial risk of developing cancer. So that's another possibility. And so we've got these, these are the different health states that are thought to be relevant to patients with this condition. And so what we do in this model is we imagine a thousand, it can be 10,000, but patients starting with the virus, positive for the virus, but non-serotic. And we say, right, if we give them the current treatments, what will happen over the rest of their lifetime? And basically, what will happen is a few will, will have the virus cleared, maybe half of them, maybe. The rest will essentially progress through the paths here ultimately ending up um, with death. 
We really want to compare that with what happens if we add in sophosphere. And of course, what we're expecting is many more people might make the move to the cleared virus because the drug's more effective, it's also easier to take. And so the real payback from improved treatment is fewer patients are going to reach these very unpleasant and, and very expensive health states. So, to do the, run a model like this, we need what are called transition probabilities. This is simply telling us um, at what rate do people move from one health state to another. So, for each of these arrows, that is a transition. That's a movement between health states. And the arrow back in itself means that you started in the health state, and then after a time period, you're still in that health state. Okay? And so what we're expecting, in particular, is the new treatment should increase this transition clearance of the virus. And of course, if that happens, there's then fewer patients available to come through to these more severe health states. So for all of these arrows, we need a number, a transition probability, something between zero and one. Zero means the transition can't happen. One means you are guaranteed in the next time period to move. So it's somewhere between zero and one. And um, for the clearance of the virus, um, data came from the Sovosovia trials. And they're fairly small trials, sometimes um, single arm trials. Uh, sometimes against a, an active comparator, and they were a relatively small trials. Also, there was data from historical controls. Um, so we had quite a good idea from previously what happens to untreated patients, because a lot of patients weren't thought suitable for interferon and ribavirin because it's a difficult one to take. Um, so th those studies provided some of the data, but there's a whole series of transitions here where any trial is not going to capture these because these are going to be largely future events. So for the trial, you may get data on some of these transitions, but for the these more future events, you're going to have to go to the literature to get estimates. Um, and so that's the case here. Is this all blindingly obvious? Do, do stop me or whatever if you want any clarification. Okay. I'll push on. <laughs> so, drug costs. Um, these were the costs for, the, for, for England. Um, and so we've got the 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 or the telaprevir or the bisepravir. Uh, these treatments had particular costs. Costs of pegylase interferon, nice and cheap. Just unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. Um, ribavirin, even cheaper. Uh, and so we're interested in the total drug costs. And so as you can see. Um, Adding in sophosphorus, if you were successful in treating in 12 weeks, the drug costs not too bad um, compared to, say, some of it, some 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 other ex pra existing practice, a bit more expensive, but uh, it doesn't look too bad. In the event that you have to go out to 24 weeks treatment. It's rather, rather higher. But just the context was this. Most patients, if they were getting treated, were probably in this sort of category previously. Pegylated interferon ribavirin cost about 10,000. And so now, almost, it was almost overnight, the NHS 
is facing the prospect of not spending 10,000 on the treatment, but 37, 35, or maybe even 70,000 on the treatment. And this picture of a rapid change in expenditure repeated itself all around the world. And so there's not a single country didn't face a bit of a problem um, with that, such an abrupt increase in potential expenditure. Um, that was the treatment costs. There's also, as I said, um, health state costs. So just being in different health states um, has a cost. Um, F0 to F3 and F4, these are measures of how, how much damage the liver has incurred. Measures of fibrosis. Um, if you get to needing a transplant, that's pretty expensive. Living with decompensated cirrhosis, quite expensive as well. Notice these costs are coming from the literature and are quite old estimates. 2006, 2001. Now all they did was then adjust them for inflation. But to what extent are these costs likely to be relevant in 2014 or something like that? It really doesn't like me going faster. Um, yes. Oh, I just spent five minutes trying to go forward. <laughs> to the, to the oh, right. You, you, yeah. you talked about the, um, the transition. transition. The transition probabilities, mm -hmm. but you did not explain how you, how you, you apply these transition probabilities to the models. Okay, sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it comes of trying to cram, you know, uh, Six lectures into one. Right. In, a, in, a, in this approach, a Markov model, you essentially are, it's a bit like taking a snapshot over time. And so you start at time zero, and in, in the model you have everybody in the non-serotic state. Then you roll forward, say, a month or three months, depending on the condition, sometimes a longer period, and you say, right, in, well, actually, quite a good one here would be 12 weeks, three months, because the treatment's meant to last that long. In three months, how many patients are still in that health state where they started? How many have transited or moved to another health state? Then in another three months later, how many are in the different health states? And so you've got a series of, if you like, snapshots over time, and over time, Fewer and fewer people are going to be in that starting health state. They're going to have moved to other places. And so that, that's how you're doing it. Um, and you typically run the model for the patient's lifetime. So if you start with 1,000 patients, you let the model run until everybody's dead. Now, of course, this is for the computer. It's nothing. I mean, it's just a blink. But um, that's what you do. Does that answer your question? I mean, there's a whole lot of questions. Do, where do we get the transition probability from? And that's when we take the trial data and we look at um, how many people are um, moving from health state, one health state to another over time, and we turn that into a rate. Yeah. yeah. This looks like a closed model. Do you, do you allow also entry to the model? For example, those who normally be blocked are into the model. Right. It, in the basic model here, in asking the question, should we use, um, should we add sofosfavir in as a treatment to patients who are non-serotic, we start with everyone there. If we then want to ask the question, what if they have cirrhosis, we just run the model again, but this time start with a thousand people with compensated cirrhosis. So it is closed, but it does allow us to look at different, different ways of looking at it. Um, you, where you, you wouldn't start with a thousand with decompensated cirrhosis because there's nothing you can do for them. Well, uh, the sofosfavir is not going to help. Which software do you use? Um, typically, these will be run in Excel. That's the most common one that's used. 
um, for the appraisal committee that I'm on. Um, but of course, there are other packages out there, but um, Excel's quite flexible, at least for, for Markov modeling, cohort modeling. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, it's it's a, in the context of an infectious disease, which of course um, hepatitis C is, um, it's fair to say this is a static model, not dynamic. Now, um, by that, we are not considering, or let's put it fair, the manufacturer who created the model, we then review the model and the results from it. The model is not considering prevention of transmission. Now, prevention of transmission may well be an important issue because a very large number of the people who are RHCV positive in an English context um, are intravenous drug users, in which case they may well be more likely to transmit to other people than non-drug users because of sharing of needles and things like that. Um, I have myself d done a paper allowing for, not just me, it was lots of co-authors, but it sounds good if I say I have myself, um, but uh, I was a small, small part in a, a paper that did a dynamic model. And what we actually showed was that um, there was important prevention benefit here. And uh, it does lead to important questions about who to treat first, uh, which I think we just touched briefly on on um, Friday. Yes, yeah, so this is static model. And all the models for succeeding treat, um, direct, directly acting antivirals, they've all been um, static, which is curious. It's a child care. Excel's pretty flexible. You might want something more specialized. You might want a more specialized package. Um, the big distinction often in packages is whether it's a cohort model or it's an individual level model. Now, if it's individual level, something like Excel may not really be satisfactory. Uh, but for cohort models, so we've got our thousand people and asking what happens to the cohort, generally it's, it's quite acceptable. Okay. Done. Um, health state utilities. We need, these are how we weight the times people spend in different health states. And so we need, a num we need numbers. And these are the numbers that went into the model. Um, that starting state, you, you're, you've got HCV, but you're non-serotic, 0.77. This is on a scale where zero is considered the value of dead and one um, value of full health. Compensated cirrhosis, by contrast, has a value of um, 0.55. Um, yeah. Now, the thing to point out here is these numbers, and I'm not even allowed to tell you what these ones are, <laughs> some sort of conf commercial and confidence argument, I, I, I don't get, but anyway. Um, these numbers have come from lots of different sources. And so you could have a real concern about whether they mean the same thing. And so, for example, um, a lot of these ones, I think, were a measure called the EQ5D, but this one is the SF6D. It's a different measure. Um, sometimes it's very small samples, but those were the data available, and that's the characteristic of decision making, where a decision has to be made. You want to look at the evidence. You want the best evidence possible, but the best evidence possible may not be very good. Um, 
And again, yeah, again, some of it's quite old data. 96 to 98. Yeah. But we need these numbers to weight the time people spend in the different health states. Because that's going to give us our qualities. And that's the results. And I showed you a table like this last Friday. So it allows us to make quite fine distinctions about whether or not the patient is cirrhotic or not, whether or not they're treatment naive or treatment experienced, um, whether they belong to any particular genotype. Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I'm going too fast, am I? Sorry. There yeah, we are. Um, right. Yes. I mean, the, at least in England, the guide, the methods guide for submissions to, for drugs to be appraised emphasizes the use of systematic review to try and identify the best possible evidence. Uh, there is a sort of hierarchy with respect to health state utility values we tend to prefer to see, see values that come from the trial itself. So we're taking treatment effectiveness, maybe from a trial or series of trials. If possible, we'd quite like to see the health state utility values, these weights, to come from the same trials. If that's not possible, they can come from the literature. And so it's then important to demonstrate that these values from the literature are the most appropriate ones to use. If that's not possible, um, there's something called mapping, where you can maybe predict values by using some other measure. Um, but yes, so, so there's a sort of there's guidance, a methods guide that says this is how we would like it done, and gives alternatives if that's not possible. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, um, where there is no evidence, as it were, you then fall back on things like expert opinion. Uh, and there's different ways of collecting expert opinion, but you, you could then try and get some consensus about what values should go into the model. That's not really very desirable, but in the absence of other evidence, uh, it's probably the best you can do. And it still has the merit, at least, it's transparent. People can see what numbers went into the model and how they were obtained. Whereas if you don't do that, and you just uh, ask people, should we recommend this or not? And they say yes or no, you don't know what their reasoning was. You, you don't know what information they've used to form their judgment. Different countries. Um, yes. Quite possibly. Um, we do have EQ5D values for many different countries, about 26 different countries, one of which is Japan. So it's been scored or valued in a Japanese population. Um, there are differences between countries. That's true. Um, I had a, a public health MSc public health student I was supervising and then she enjoyed the experience so much she decided to do a PhD with me. I'm sorry, advertising there. Um, and I said, fine, what do you want to do it on? She said, oh, she's a rehabilitation doctor. I'm interested in doing a cost-effectiveness study of rehabilitation. I said, okay, fine. And then I said, how are you going to measure health benefits? She said, hmm. I'll think about that. She came back and I said, well, Actually, I think EQ5D looks quite a good measure. I said, okay, fine, yeah, yeah. Where are you doing the study? In Thailand. I said, oh, so you're going to use UK values in Thailand? Or are you going to use the values, say, from Japan or South Korea? 
and she sort of thought about it and came back and said, I'm going to collect values for Thailand. So she ended up not doing a PhD on the cost effectiveness of rehabilitation, but she very enterprisingly went and got funding from the Thai government and did a study, a representative survey of Thai population, sample size, about 1,300, I think, where she got them to value the EQ5D health states. And she, so, so she then got Thai values. And the funny thing was, when we compared the Thai values to the values for all the other countries, Japan, South Korea, etc., the country Thailand was closest to in scores was England. And so you could say, oh, she didn't really need to bother. <laughs> but that would be a very negative way of looking at it. I mean, she was absolutely inspiring to, to sort of have the initiative and just make it happen. But as I say, it just so happened the values were similar to the English values. I put it down to them driving on the left-hand side of the road. That's what we do in uh, England as well. No, I'm not serious. Uh, well, we do. I'm not serious now. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay, I'll try and answer this question. I'm only looking at, yeah, okay. Um, it's one of my pet subjects, so I, it's irresistible not to answer your question. SF36 um, is short form 36. It comes from an original measure that had about 72 items. And so it's a general health measure. It's got different domains um, and it's very widely used. It doesn't have any scoring system beyond if you answer yes or no, you're getting one or zero. You know. So it, it, you don't get a, there's no weighting involved, no preferences involved. EQ5D has identified what, how important different dimensions are, dimensions are, mobility, pain and, and discomfort, anxiety and depression, ability to do usual activities. SF36, everything, as it were, counts the same. There's no waiting. And so for that reason, SF36 is not thought to be particularly suitable as a measure because it's missing that aspect. So um, a student, another student of mine, although I was just an external advisor, for his thesis, he decided to come up with this SF6D. So taking the SF36 data and giving it weights, obtaining weights, and he ended up with the 6D, says so six dimensions, and his SF6D, his name is John Brazier, um, he, it, it utilizes information from about 12 of, of the SF36 um, items. Uh, it's quite a good measure, however, I probably still think EQ5D is better, uh, partly because we've just got much more data on it and much more evidence about it. SF6D has a rather unfortunate um, floor effect. The lowest score you can get on the SF6D is like 0.24. EQ5D, you can go down and down. In fact, you can go let below zero. The idea that some health states are worse than dead. And so that's a bit of a shortcoming on SF6D. That answer, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yes, I suppose it does. All right, don't use SF36, but if you're <laughs> using SF36 data, turn it into an SF6D first. Well, I think there's some um, transformation table from SF16 maybe into EQ5. Um, there has, be, there has been mapping from the SF6D to EQ5D, yes, because they are quite closely correlated. Um, so, so there is that possibility as well. But of course, any time you map, you're adding uncertainty because you, there's uncertainty about the relationship or the equation that you're mapping with. Also, 
Um, EQ5D starts by asking a VAS question, but it's not generally used for valuation purposes. Um, what's used is the subsequent time trade-off questions. I, 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 could, I could speak for hours and hours without stopping on this subject, <laughs> but I must not give in to that temptation. So yeah, so, but, so the point being, we then get some recommendations based on evidence of clinical effectiveness and on evidence of cost effectiveness. And in the English case, a positive recommendation from, from NICE is mandatory. The NHS must provide within three months these treatments. The red ones, if we don't recommend, it's then up to the NHS, but they usually don't provide it because they, they haven't got the resource. Okay, moving on. Second case study, maybe one case study would have been appropriate, but second case study. Oops. Um, non small cell lung cancer. It's quite an interesting condition. Um, 85 to 90% of lung cancers are non small cell. The non small cell lung cancers themselves are further divided into squamous cell adenoma carcinomas and large cell carcinomas. The majority of cases are um, symptomatic on presentation. Occasionally, someone might have had a routine chest x-ray and the problem was spotted, but usually um, symptoms develop over time. Patients eventually consult their GP and the GP eventually realizes it might be lung cancer. And quite often, um, the disease has spread by that stage, which is quite unfortunate. So in uh, England, 2013, almost a quarter of the patients presented with stage three disease. So that's locally or regionally advanced. And 46% of stage four disease where there's been metastases and so the disease has spread to other parts of the body. As a consequence of this fairly late detection, um, the prognosis for these patients is very poor. So median survival with lung cancer is six months. 35% of people with lung cancer and 14% of people with stage four disease survive more than a year. So it's, it's bad. Choosing your cancers, don't choose this one. Probably, probably, mm, don't want to be facetious, but probably choose to be a man and choose to have prostate cancer. That's probably that's terrible. There are still obviously serious cases there, but it's just, it just tends to be such a slow growing pr pr problem. Okay, um, the good news for these patients is there's been a lot of therapeutic advance. Um, so, and in particular, um, the rise of what are called targeted therapies. And in particular, um, this thing called EGFR, uh, epidermal growth f f factor f receptor. <laughs> For obvious reasons, EGFR, <laughs> so you don't have to remember it. Um, and so there's a certain subgroup of patients, EGFR, um, TK positive, who will who have a chance of responding to these new treatments. Uh, if, if you're not in this subgroup, you haven't really got much chance of getting benefit. And so these have been coming sort of thick and fast. Gefitinib, alotinib, afatinib, um, nesitumumab, and osimertinib. So there's a lot happening there. There's another um, subgroup, and they're almost not overlapping at all. These are um, ALK positive. Uh, 
I think it's aplastic lymphoma kinase inhibitors, ALK positive, and we've got these treatments coming along, crisotinib, seritinib, electinib, uh, and uh, there's also distinction whether you can use it in untreated patients or whether it will work with previously treated patients. And if that's not enough, even more recently, we've got what are called immunotherapies. And in this particular case, PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. Now, these are creating, the previous drugs are creating a lot of interest because they're targeted. So instead of just giving it to everybody, you are focusing in on the group that are more likely to benefit. So they're quite exciting. These are particularly exciting because the idea is you're not attacking the cancer cells, you're trying to, the right word, almost reprogram the immune system, the body's own defenses to, to, to recognize um, the cancer cells and to, to kill them. Um, PD is um, programmed cell death. I mean, it's wonderful names. I don't know, it's just sort of it, oh, science fiction. It's just kind of exciting. Uh, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for these. Um, these are the main ones. These are the ones with respect to um, non-small cell lung cancer. Pembrolizumab, it's also finding use with um, metastatic melanoma. Uh, nivolumab, which has recently been getting approval all over the place in terms of different cancers, but non-small cell lung cancer is one of the early ones. And just coming along now is this other one, atezolizumab. And no doubt in the drug pipeline there'll be other ones still. Um, now, these are all expensive. They all work to some extent. There is indeed a slight suggestion that some drugs, like maybe nivolumab, there'll be some patients in which it almost is effectively a cure. Now, this is a patient group, I've just given you some statistics, that it's really, literally, the, almost the worst news you could get. Oh, sorry, you've got non-small cell lung cancer. The survival is so poor. And so suddenly we've got these things, new drugs, changing the whole prospect. So, it's that problem again. We've got a patient group who needs something. We've got drugs that may be able to give it to some extent. And we've got a high price. Now, of course, what we could say is, great, these new therapies, we must have them. And we'll just take the money from somewhere else. We could do that. But you have to remember, in taking the money from somewhere else, there's some other patients who are going to suffer. You could, of course, just say, we'll increase taxes. And it doesn't sound the same kind of suffering, but <laughs> the taxpayers are going to suffer because they're paying more tax. And, well, governments really don't like raising taxes. Politicians don't really like raising taxes. And I, I've yet to meet anybody who really likes paying taxes. Uh, the way I look upon it sometimes is, well, if I'm paying more tax, it does mean I've earned more. So that's a good thing, isn't it? So fine. <laughs> I can't get more enthusiastic than that. Some people at, at, at election time will... Um, will say, you know, sometimes a party will say, look, vote for us, we will increase your taxes, but we'll put it into education, or we'll put it into health care. And a small number of people vote for them. <laughs> Not the majority. So we, we, have, we have a real problem here. Now, there's different ways of resolving it. You could say um, to the oncologists, say, look, Tell me, is this really a good drug? And if they say, yes, we need it, you can say, right, we're going we're to buy it. That'd be one way of making decisions. Uh, 
Another way of making decisions is to say, OK, we'll set up a sort of committee structure, we'll request evidence and we'll give you guidance as to how you put your evidence together. Evidence on clinical effectiveness, evidence on cost effectiveness. We'll carefully review the evidence. We'll have witnesses and ask them questions. We'll then discuss among ourselves, should we or shouldn't we recommend this drug? That's the nice appraisal approach. I think that approach is better. I, I think that's a better way of doing things. There's a possibility of being quite transparent because you can make a lot of the data and information available to other people. Uh, the meetings are open to the public, so in principle people can sit and listen to part of the meeting. I think there is another alternative, and I wouldn't mind trying this one, and you just say to the oncologists or all those involved in treating the cancer patients, this is your budget. We're not going to change it. Tell me how do you want to spend it? Do you want to spend more of it on pembrolizumab and nivolumab? Or do you want to provide more palliative services? Or do you want to provide more detection services? Do you want to invest in more screening for early detection? Doesn't get rid of the problem, but it, they might, this group might then be quite good at seeing the opportunity cost. But right now, that's not the system in any country I know. And so basically, clinical groups, anything new, they typically want it. Because uh, they're not paying the price. It's elsewhere in the health service the price is being paid. OK, so that's the problem. So what's been happening? Well, it's back to the same idea again. Identify the different health states that might be relevant, and then construct a model to predict how long patients will spend in different health states. And then you're going to run your model for existing treatments, run your model with the new treatment, and you're going to compare them. And so um, almost all, these, all the drugs I've just shown you in the last three slides have been evaluated using a model which distinguishes progression-free and progressed disease. Some of them have additional progression-free states. For example, progression-free on treatment, progression-free off treatment. Um, the models have all used, have all to date been something called a petition survival model. I'll explain that to you in a second. Uh, and they've had a wide range of cycles. So one week up to one month, and time horizon five, six years, up to 25 years. So the cycle is that period at which you, you take a snapshot. Where are the patients just now? And then one week later, where are they? Now in this condition, things can move fast enough that in one week, things change. There are other conditions, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or something, where a weekly cycle would just be too short. Nothing would be happening. So this is the model. Now, I think on your handout, <laughs> rather importantly, you're missing an arrow from here to here. I can only apologize. Um, that would be a rather strange model. <laughs> so the idea, again, is so we, we start our patients progression free. And over time, they could stay progression free. That's this arrow here. Or they could progress or possibly die. Uh, if they progress, for a period of time they can remain progressed and then in due course die. And that's, that really simple model has been used in about 80% of the evaluations of those drugs I showed you. The only variations have really been to um, distinguish additional progression-free states as I say, one where you're still on treatment, another where you've maybe stopped treatment, but you haven't progressed. The loop on death is um, just reminding us all that, um, well, it's one view of the world. When you're dead, you're dead. Um, 
this actually did cause me some concern with respect to my Thai PhD student that she was going out to collect preferences in a predominantly Buddhist country, although the southern part is um, Muslim. Um, because, of course, from my primitive grasp of Buddhism, there is a belief in, in other lives. Uh, and if you really believe there's other lives, maybe death doesn't, doesn't hold quite the same meaning to you. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's not such a thing to be avoided, perhaps. Um, but anyway, um, her respondents, behave, Buddhist or otherwise, interestingly, we, we didn't collect information on whether they were Buddhist or not. In hindsight, I kind of wish we had. But um, it, the respondents in Thailand answered the questions in much the same way people in other countries answer the questions. But yes, sorry, that's a sidetrack. Dead is dead. You don't have to put this in, um, but uh, quite often pe people do. Yes, sorry. All oh, right. Um, this basic model has been the one that's been used again and again, depending on whether, depending on what line of treatment um, you're considering introducing the drug, that will determine whether the patients you start with are untreated or they've had previous treatments. So if you're looking at it, say, as a second line treatment, that would imply they've already had some form of treatment which they either couldn't tolerate or they've progressed, their diseases continue to progress. Uh, so uh, effectively you're running a different model. So if, if, if you're asking, should we look at pembrolizumab second line or first line, or can we do both? You can do them both, but it'd have to be separate models. You, you can't sort of put them all together. Does that? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I didn't spend any time on it, but if we go back, um, yeah, in this one, oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, this was pembrolizumab after chemo, and this was pembrolizumab in untreated disease. And so they're separate models because the data is going to be different, the transition probability is going to be different. Oh, we're just coming to that. We're coming to that. No? I'm not meant to finish for another 16 minutes. Um, so that's the simple three-state model. They've all been partitioned survival models. And these are quite interesting form of modeling, which is a bit like a Markov model but almost simpler to, to operationalize. So, if you think of a, uh, the basic Markov model, it could look like this, and we'd have to calculate a transition. Oh, every arrow is a transition. I agree we don't need one here, because it's a, it's a, a certainty that you, you stay here. Um, so you could calculate transitions and run a model rather similar to the hepatitis C one I, I, I had up before. However, in recent years, in, for cancer therapies, and certainly for all of these non-small cell lung cancer, they've used something called a partition survival model. And what you do in a partition survival model is at different points in time, so it could be every week or every month, you ask, of our patients, how many are dead, how many are still progression-free, and how many have progressed disease? So you're getting the same information about how much time patients spend in the different health states, but you're getting to it, if you like, more directly, rather than calculating transition probability. 
Now to do this, you need um, essentially survival curves. The dashed line here is the progression-free survival curve. The solid line is overall survival. Now if you have those two bits of information, it allows you for any point in time to work out what proportion of the people you started with um, have died, because it's this bit here. What proportion are progression free? I should do it on the line here. Progression free. And the difference between progression free and overall survival is progress disease. Because in this model, you're either progression free, progressed, or dead. And so if we know two of them, we always know the third. And that's a petition survival model. They've proved very popular in recent years. Um, if I had more time, I'd love to sort of work out when it happened and why it happened that we moved from, from Markov modeling to these petition survival models. But I don't have time. <laughs> but I would be interested. <laughs> Okay, so it's giving you exactly the same information in the end. How much time patients spend in different health states? Because it's the time in the different health states that allows you to calculate the qualities and it allows you to calculate the costs. Um, but to get there, we have to extrapolate survival. We have to model survival. Because, of course, trials typically never go on long enough. And trials, um, when a trial ends, there's a lot of patients still alive. And that's good news in one sense. But the problem is, we don't know when they would die. I mean, in, in an ideal world, almost, the trial would go on until everybody was dead. Then you'd know when everybody died. But of course, that's complete, even with these cancers, that's impractical. Because uh, there's going to be a few people that live a long time. And so you have to extrapolate um, progression-free survival. You have to extrapolate overall survival. And um, that is, is quite a challenge sometimes. But it's important to do it um, to distinguish between these progression-free and pr progressed health states because the costs will vary. For a lot of these, a lot of these drugs, you stop the treatment on progression. And so you need to work out how long people are progression-free and therefore still getting treatment. Uh, it's also the case that the health state utility value, the score or the weight being attached to progress disease, is lower than the weight attached to progression-free. You know, people are healthier while they're progression-free. Now, there's a lot of challenges in extrapolating progression-free survival. And these, these, are, these come up time and time again. Um, first one is this. Typically, and particularly with new drugs, you may only have one trial. The trial that was done to get um, regulatory approval from the FDA or the EMA. The trial participants may be rather different from the patients you're about to give the drug to, uh, if you approve it. You're, if you approve it for routine practice, your patients in a routine practice may be a bit different from your patients in the trial. Typically, in routine practice, patients are older. And typically, um, they may have had more pre-treatment and failed it. Um, they may also have more comorbidities. And so one challenge you've got is trying to predict what will happen, if you like, to real patients or routine patients from tri by using trial data. That's the first one. Um, the second one is the one I was just emphasizing previously, that trials have limited duration. And so you have to try and predict the future from the trial, what happens next. And that, um, that's difficult because there's different ways of doing it and the different methods give you different answers. Another problem, I'll give one example of this, I hope, um, is you're, looking, you're trying to identify a treatment effect. So what is the effect of giving, say, pembrolizumab compared to the current therapy? 
And the problem in identifying that effect is something called treatment switching. Patients in the, under the current therapy or in the control arm, if they progress, may well switch to pembrolizumab. And so essentially, that muddies the water because you're no longer getting a, a very clear picture of the treatment effect. Uh, there's things you can do, but it's, a, it's an, another problem. A final problem, as if there weren't enough, is often you haven't got trial data comparing your treatments of interest. So you might be interested in comparing A with B, but you've only got data A with C and B with C. And so you have to make an indirect treatment comparison. I'll give an example of that in a second. Right, extrapolation survival. This is a lecture in itself. There's lots of different methods, but essentially you're fitting different statistical functions. Some of the most widely used, exponential, gamma, Gompertz, log logistic, log normal, Weibull. Increasingly being used, something called fractional polynomials and occasionally spline models. Now, you don't need to know all these. Um, all you need to know is they'll give different answers. And then you have to think about the circumstance in which this evidence is being presented. A manufacturer who wants to sell their drug is producing evidence about how well their drug works. Now, depending on which method they use, they can make their drug look better or worse. And so, um, this is a challenge because you then as a committee have to decide have they used an appropriate model or um, are they trying to in some way uh, I was going to use the word manipulate I don't know if that's the right word They're going, are they in some way making their drug look better than it perhaps really is everything starts usually with the Kaplan-Meier data um, I don't know if you've maybe come across Kaplan-Meier data. Uh, that's what's usually reported in a trial. Uh, and then you're trying to fit curves to those, those data. Um, there's a lot of issues. Are there proportional hazards or not? We just can't go there. Just there's an issue. Treatment switching. This is, I find this a fascinating one. And it's a really challenging one as to what to do about it. Quite often, patients are allowed to switch from one treatment to another um, after disease progression. Now, the estimates of progression-free survival won't be affected. That's fine. But it's going to lead, probably, to an underestimate of the difference in overall survival. Because if you've got patients who get the, act, the new treatment, but they just get it after the current treatment and so that's going to close the gap in the survival curves so you're not you're no longer getting a, a good estimate of overall survival so that's a challenge but things we can be done um, here's an example this was crizotinib so this is just a few months ago or last year actually crizotinib for previously treated alt positive cancer 87 percent of the control arm in the main trial Prof profile 1007, 87% crossed over to crizotinib. And if you didn't adjust the hazard ratio, so you didn't allow for crossover, the estimated hazard ratio was 0.854, with a confidence interval actually <laughs> quite either side of one. If you adjusted for crossover, if you recognise that 87% of the control arm subsequently got crizotinib and adjusted for that, you get a new hazard ratio of 0.38 and it is um, statistically significant. So it's a very real problem. But the challenge again is there's different ways of adjusting for crossover and some will make a bigger adjustment than others, which is right. And then, is it finally? No, probably not indirect treatment comparison. So this was a case of nivolumab, and we wanted to see a comparison of nivolumab against nintedinib and docetaxel, and possibly nivolumab against best supportive care. But the trial we had 
called Checkmate 57 was nivolumab against docetaxel. So you're forced to identify a network of treatments and by being able to con compare um, the nivolumab docetaxel treatment effect, we could compare it with an intedinib docetaxel against docetaxel treatment effect. Now that sounds so straightforward, but that will only work well if the patients in the docetaxel arm of Checkmate 57 are similar to the patients in the docetaxel arm of this thing called Loom Lung 1, another trial. And frequently, <coughs> they aren't similar. And so it's a, a real challenge. Then you've got to estimate your quality just in life years. Um, this is, I can skip this quite quickly because we've had questions and I've answered some of them on this. There's different ways of making the adjustment. There's EQ5D, there's SF6D. Um, there's do you use a value from the trial or do you use something in the literature? Or might you possibly map? And uh, again, they'll give you different answers. Uh, these are just examples, you don't need this, but uh, these are the range of values. Remember where it's progression free or progress disease. It's the same health state again and again in all of these, but the numbers vary quite a lot. And they vary quite a lot sometimes because it's a different measure being used, uh, but sometimes it's the same measure, but it comes from a different trial. And so which is the right answer? You know, is there a right answer? Then you've got to compare costs. That was just to get your qualities. You've got to compare costs. Now you think this would be the easy bit, but it isn't really easy because the first thing you need to know is what quantity of drug will be used. Now the quantity of drug will depend on two main things. How long it is before someone progresses and on um, are they experiencing toxicities adverse events and therefore might they stop treatment sooner or might they cut the dose, adjust the dose and so that introduces uncertainty as to how much drug will be used. Now that matters because a major driver of the cost is how much of the new drug you're using. Another problem, this is not a problem for the committee because we get to see the information, but most drugs the unit uh, the unit cost is confidential because a deal has been done, a secret deal on the price. And so how does a manufacturer making a case for its product, how does it know how to cost its rival's product if, if the rival's drug was a comparator? So huge, huge challenges. Right. So I've just got a couple of slides observation. I'll make them very quick. Um, I haven't emphasized that you have to choose the right comparators. You know, depending what you compare your drug to, you get a different answer. So that's a big issue, but I haven't had time to go into that. But the greatest challenge in this area is convincing modeling of survival. You've usually got maybe just one trial, and it may not be a very large trial. The patients may not be quite similar to the patients that you expect in routine practice. I think it is also the case we, we need to make a bit more progress on how we measure health state utility values. That is how we weight the time people spend in different health states. But I hope, although I've highlighted problems, I hope you've got the idea that it is quite possible to dig into the clinical effectiveness evidence, add an economic aspect to it, and come up with information that's potentially useful. Um, but it is challenging. And it's particularly challenging because for, for, the, for the committee, it's an issue of, right, we want to make the best use of public money. For the industry, it's a we want to sell our drug. Now those views are not sort of diametrically opposed, but they're not in alignment. They, they are, there's a competing issue there. 
Uh, and at the same time, you've got a world out there of patients, patient groups, and clinicians who all want you to say yes. And I think that's my last slide. Let's find out if it is. Hey, <laughs> it is. So, any questions, comments? Apologies for squeezing a lot into a little space. But it's to give you the sort of flavour of the issues. Yes, please. Yes, that's, that's a, a, a good question. Most trials stop collecting data when the patient progresses. So the estimate of the progressed health state um, post-progression, this estimate frequently is collected at the last time, or if you like, the first time they decided progression had happened. But of course, the nature of progression is when it first happened, it can be quite subtle. When it first happens, it doesn't mean suddenly your health state plummets, it's coming down. But as you get nearer death, it can get really quite low. And so that is a challenge. What some studies have done, um, uh, yeah, here's an example. Um, They've looked at time from death and are allowing a different score because, of course, after the event, once people have died, we can work backwards. That observation was so long before death, so far away. So what they've allowed for here is um, health state values that vary by time from death. But that's not very common, and the general problem is that we just don't collect, for obvious reasons, we don't collect a lot of data from patients who've progressed. Uh, because, of course, it's a bit intrusive. Mind you, the EQ5D, or indeed SF6D, you don't, you're not asking a lot of the time of the patient. It's not really too demanding, but at the same time, one can understand why studies frequently, once a patient progresses, they stop collecting data. In fact, sometimes they stop even collecting survival data, which I think is wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I'm agreeing with you. It's a real problem. And the, uh, the problem is lack of data. And the data we have is probably overstating, mm -hmm. giving too high a score for the progressed disease state, mm -hmm. usually. Yes? In the UK, uh, patient access schemes are provided for only cancer drugs or other drugs as well? Um, other drugs as well. A patient access scheme is a sort of, usually a price cut um, or something that's effectively a price cut. Uh, it's most, been most common with cancer drugs, but it's also the case there have been patient access schemes with respect to some other drugs as well. Just a word on that. Manufacturers have been fairly willing to offer confidential price cuts. And there's two reasons. One, the UK is quite a big market. So it's the NHS, you know, 60 million people. So it's quite a big market. Uh, so that's attractive to them. And two, the promise of confidentiality. Because if the price remains confidential, the only price that people know about outside of the in a circle, as it were, is the, what's called the list price, the official headline price. And uh, quite a few countries practice, and certainly Japan was doing so, I'm not sure if it's still doing, a sort of form of reference pricing where you look at prices elsewhere, and that is part of a, sometimes a formula which allows you, helps you set a price. And of course, it's in the manufacturer's interest 
that countries are using high prices as, as the reference and not the actual confidential discounted price. Okay, well, um, let me say two things. One, you may have thoughts or ideas or something after the event. All these lectures had my email address at the start of them. Um, so do feel free to contact me. Uh, I'll, you know, I will respond. I can't say it'll be helpful or what. That's the one thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say was to thank you for your attentiveness and your um, willingness to, to ask questions and in, engage in a discussion and make comments. Uh, because I do, I said this right at the outset, I think, I do realise, you know, one, it's just tiring to sit listening to people. It is. It's, it's incredibly tiring. And the second one is, for some of you, or maybe all of you, I don't know, but certainly most of you, English, of course, is not a first language, which makes it doubly tiring. So I, I want to thank you for your um, participation. And I, I, I do hope it's been a good use of your time. Because I certainly feel it's been a good use of my time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>